staff. I think I did two, three with them. And then the very last audition was with Mr. Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. I, I swear, I had to calm down. I, I, I thought I was going to faint. And then they were going to be online and see me on the floor and go, Hey, are you all right? We did our audition. It was probably 30, 45 minutes. Um, they kind of talked back and forth amongst themselves real quick. And the, the rest is history. Killers of the Flower Moon came out. And Blackie Thompson was, was introduced to the world. Hello, friends. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of the Main Idea Podcast, where today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Tommy Schultz. If you want to see the show grow in 2024 and hear from more incredible guests, please take 30 seconds and leave a five-star review on Spotify or Apple and subscribe to the YouTube channel. This helps the show get discovered organically and helps me continually to reach out to more epic people. The other way that you can support this show is by sharing it with someone who enjoys jujitsu, human performance, and strength and conditioning. Tommy Schultz is an actor, jiu-jitsu practitioner, and academy owner from Ada, Oklahoma. He starred as Blackie Thompson alongside Leonardo DiCaprio in Martin Scorsese's film, Killers of the Flower Moon, which aired this past October. I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Without further ado, the talented and humble Tommy Schultz. Well, Tommy Schultz, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be here on the show. It really means a lot. Thank you for having me. It means a lot to be here. Yeah, so a funny story about how we actually ended up here. Uh, I know that I had shared this with you over social media, but my fiance and I were watching Killers of the Flower Moon, and you came on screen for the first time, and I just tapped my fiance, and I said, that guy does jujitsu. And she was like, how do you, how do you know that? And I go, his look at his ears. And she goes, What what do you what about his ears? What do you mean? And I was like, watch. And so I did a little research online and I was like, see? And I found you on uh, on social media and I said, it's for, uh, the sign of someone who trains a lot. And sure enough, uh mixed martial artist, uh practicing jujitsu practitioner, and now you can add to the list uh big screen serious role actor. Yeah. How did a man from Ada, a small town, 16,000 people, find himself cast in a Martin Scorsese film alongside Leonardo DiCaprio in a uh, non-extra role. I mean, a serious speaking role with real screen time. And not only that, but doing such a fantastic job, especially in a movie that's dialogue heavy. You know, you're not relying on special effects and and things of this. It's really a, a showcasing of the actor themselves. So how did that come about? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for the compliments on the performance. I appreciate that a bunch. Uh, it was my wife, actually. She, uh, she works for my tribe here in Ada, Chickasaw Nation, and she had an internal email that came across uh, having an audition happening for a Mark Scorsese film, Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, I don't even think the name, uh, the, the title of the movie was out just yet. Just an email saying they were having auditions. They were having them that weekend uh, mine was in Oklahoma City, and then the following weekend they had one in Tulsa. But uh, the whole catalyst to this whole thing was my wife. Uh, I, I like to joke with her and say, you know, get your sewing machine out and let's get that uh, astronaut <laughs> suit sewed up. And let's go do something. And you know, she's she's been the rock and the push behind it all. I love it. So this email comes across her desk. Did she know that you had any aspirations or interests in acting? I mean, you're fighting people, you're you're in jiu-jitsu tournaments. Is that even on your radar? It, it, actually, it was on my radar. Okay. I, I you know you know the 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 old cliche bucket list. You know, yeah. I actually have I have a notebook of things I want to do in life, and and one of them was to be in a major motion picture. And she knew it, and she said, yeah. "Get your butt up there and go audition for it." And uh. The next thing I know, I even I even invited my my own brother and actually one of my uh, jujitsu coaches to go with me to go audition, and they they both of them both of them backed out on me on the last minute, which is okay, and yeah. I I went ahead and went up there, 
I thought it was early actually, but a whole big line already had formed and almost out the the motel that the auditions were in. So, set my time in the line, sat there and waited through. And, I, and you know, I as you see people going in the doors, you see them coming out real fast. You're like, ah, oh, this is <laughs> be a lot quicker than I thought. You know, check mark off real quick. So, yeah. so I ended up going through the whole line. I think they got my height, my weight. Uh, the, the, my clothes size uh, sized me up, my picture. And I thought, dude, that's easy. You know, and as I was walking out, a lady at the door stopped me and said, excuse me, would you like to be in a major motion picture? I said, well, yeah, sure. This is kind of why we all come up here. But yeah, absolutely. So she dragged me out a set of double doors and dragged me back in another set of double doors, handed me a script. And she said, it'll be about 30 or 45 minutes, and they'll call you to the back, and you can read your script and audition for them. So, so that was the first day, first audition. So I went back, and I believe it was, El- was Ellen Lewis sitting there. Uh, she, she introduced herself. We, we sat down, and she just said, okay, just read the lines for me, and uh, uh, I'll let you know something. So I sat down, read the lines. She said, great, perfect. Can you come back tomorrow? And I'm still naive to the whole industry anyway, movie industry, audition, anything in it right now. Even till today, I'm still learning a lot. But I said, yeah, sure, sure, I can come back tomorrow. <laughs> and at that time, I was just thinking, oh, man, it's a long drive. I'm, I'm an hour and a half away from Oklahoma City, and I'm like, oh, you know, okay, yeah, I'll come back. And so I come back, I think it was that Friday, I come back that Saturday, and... um. We met again, and she asked, would you be interested in a bigger part? And I go, sure, sure. She goes, well, a couple of more pages for your audition. Are you comfortable with that? I said, yeah, sure. I said, give me, um, uh, uh, give me 30, 45 minutes. Give me a little time to look over it and, you know, memorize a little bit of it. And she said, great, sure. And I, I did, and then she asked, do you want to drive home and, and work on it and then come back. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm, no, I'm too far away. Let me let me just look at it real quick. And they gave me a, a very nice young assistant. She helped me out. We read the lines together, and I was 30, 45 minutes. I said, I, this is probably as good as it's going to get. So I told right. her I'm ready. And she goes, okay. She let everybody know. And uh, that second audition that day, I went in there and, it was it was an uncomfortable line for me because there was uh, a female's anatomy was in the line and, and and the whole table was nothing but ladies nothing but women and I'm sitting here going oh my god you know I don't I don't even I don't talk this way in front of you know you just don't talk this way in front of ladies and I'm like ah oh. so so I had a a real quick uh, decision to make you know if you want to do this you're gonna have to do it. And so I did the scene, we did the lines, and again, Miss Ellen Lewis, and then Miss Renee Haynes was there that day, I, I do recall, and their whole staff was there, and they said, perfect, amazing, great. And then that's when they were asking me, you know, how many, what ha- what else have you been in? <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm trying, I'm trying, uh, 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 and, yeah. and Miss Lewis says, you haven't been in anything, have you? I said, no, I haven't been in nothing. She goes, yeah. great. I'm yeah. great. Thank you for coming. We'll give you a phone call. We'll we'll text you, email you. We'll let you we'll let you know something some sometime. I said, all right, great. I believe that was, I believe that was 2020. Oh wow. And if if I'm if I'm correct, it's been a while. That's when COVID started, and that weekend, that following Monday, is when everything got shut down and COVID started Uh happening. So it was a whole year, a whole year before um, I heard anything. You know, I I, everybody heard shut down COVID, everything shut down, blah blah blah, and then I went back to work. I mean, like, okay, well, stuff's on hold everywhere. Including right. Hollywood and everybody. 
I went back to work. It didn't. My world didn't stop. Bills don't stop. And you got to go to work. So <laughs> you're like, but I, I might be in a movie. <laughs> yeah, I might be in a movie a year later. But right. I went back to work and I waited a whole year, almost exactly a whole year. I think we, I think we auditioned in November, and then and then in October, like eleven month, twelve month, almost exactly a year. I get a phone call at work, and um, it says New York. You know. Either it's either gonna be a spam call or it tells what state, city, whatever. And right. I go, I don't know nobody from New York, so I <laughs> clicked it off and I went back to work. And so I'm sitting there and it didn't dawn on me. About 20 minutes go by, 15, 20 minutes go by, and I go, wait a minute, I do know somebody from New York. I get back on the horn, I dial that number up, and it was Miss Ellen Lewis, and she goes, Hello, Tommy, are you are you still interested in being in a in a in a major motion picture. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am, I am. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am, I am. You bet. And she said, fantastic, great. We'll set up some more auditions with you, and uh, I'll, I'll, we'll be in touch. So, and at that time, it was all Zoom auditions at that time, so there was no uh, all in-person auditions and stuff. So it was all Zoom. So I did a couple more with Miss Ellen Lewis and Renee Haynes and some of her staff. I think I did two, three with them. And then the very yeah. last audition was with Mr. Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. Who are and, they? Yeah, right? Who are they? <laughs> Jeez. I was getting set up in the in my living room here, just like yeah. we are. And uh, I, I swear I had to calm down. I, I, I thought <laughs> I was going to faint. And then they were going to yeah. be online and see me on the floor and go, hey, are you all right? <laughs> and so, yeah, that's a whole nother movie. Martin Scorsese <laughs> and Leonardo DiCaprio save aspiring actor from cardiac arrest yeah. <laughs> on the Zoom call. Oh, whole other movie. Yeah. And so I calmed down. We got online and they were very nice and very uh, welcoming. And uh I couldn't ask for better. Uh, and Marty, the cool, I, you know, there was all kind of cool things. But Marty goes, Leo, you want me to, you want me to read some of the lines to him? Uh, nah, I got it, Marty. I got, I'll read them all. I'll read them all. I'm like, oh, all right. So that's, wow. so we, we did our audition. It was probably 30, 45 minutes. Um, they kind of talked back and forth amongst themselves real quick. You know, are you going to be staying in Oklahoma? Or you got a place? Nah, I'm going to get a da, 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 outside of town in a motel. Yeah. And I'm like, all right. All right. Well, uh, have a good one, Tommy. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> like, okay. So, end of, this, end of, end of audition. Yeah. Um, so, I'm sitting there. Uh, I get a phone call. And uh, it, she said, uh, uh, "Miss Ellen said this is off the record, but uh, you know, I think we, I think you got the part. Congratulations." She goes, "You know, don't let no wow. one know just yet, but until <laughs> until we get everything situated, but you got the part. Congratulations!" And so, of course, I was, I was, uh, are you for real? I mean. And then she said, are you, are you still there? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm still here. I'm, I'm still breathing. Let me catch my breath. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I got the part. Um, and that, the rest is history. We went to work, I think, March, April. Yeah. And we worked on it for eight, nine months, uh, something like that. Uh, you know, and then Killers of the Flower Moon came out, and Blackie Thompson was, was introduced to the world. Yeah, if we, you know, if we go back to this, <clears throat> the interview or the audition process. Now, I've only spoken to you for twelve minutes and had interactions <clears throat> via social media to book this, but you seem extremely humble, a very down to earth person, a, a real person, and Blackie Thompson is everything but. He is a diabolical monster, right? Who has murdered police officers, murdered plenty of people was been convicted, escaped from prison. I mean, the guy is a, a, a the worst iteration of a human, right, that you can imagine. What was it like, pl like, interview? I mean, even, you know, you're talking about the convictions of, or conflictions on even a couple words in the script, let alone coming into this character as this complete different version of who you are. What was that like for you when you're developing this character in your head? Because it is your representation of it, right? When you're on screen playing him, you are playing him. You've become this character for the movie. And in Killers of Flower Moon, I, I really, 
mean this when I say, I mean, it is a beautiful movie front to back, but all the characters in it, they fit in such a special way. Even, you know, Sturgill Simpson's part in it, yeah. he fits totally perfect. And then there's this one gentleman, and I, I feel so bad for forgetting the name, uh, but we were looking him up. We're like, this guy just, he's so perfect for this. And he turned out to actually be a rancher in Oklahoma who just, he had been a rancher forever and they cast him as such, but it was, he was so perfect for it. So what was it like for you the, from the interview process to actually bringing this to life on screen, playing this evil, malevolent person? Um, more freedom than you think. Uh, I think, I think uh, the development of the character was absolutely that more freedom about being able to be a bad guy and not knowing that you're not going to get in trouble for it because you know, you're, 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 Building the character, you're in a movie, uh, which the the storyline was all true, of course. But on, on my side of things, I'm in a movie. I get I get to portray somebody that I don't get to during my normal life because, like I said, that's just not who I am. Um. Uh, and I think being just a little bit of a history guy too. I I love Oklahoma history. I wish I knew this history about killer of uh, killers of the flower moon which would have been great to know a lot more about. But, you know, you, you hear about all of our outlaws in Oklahoma, too, in the Oklahoma Territory. I mean, these guys didn't care. Hell, there were guys from, there was uh, Babyface came to Oklahoma. There was Jesse James. There was all kind of outlaws that came to Oklahoma. But a, a lot of the people in Oklahoma didn't view them as outlaws. They got help from a lot of people, too. So... I think living in Oklahoma, I had, I had many, many good examples of, of what an outlaw should have been, especially during that time in the 20s. I mean, it was still, it was still almost free range, literally cowboys and Indians, cowhands and Indians, uh, with a little bit of a gangster twist on it uh, with the, the modern age of the vehicle being, in, being put in to mi literally middle of nowhere. If you ever go to Pahuska or Osage and imagine what it would have been in the 20s, I mean, they were there in the middle of nowhere, but uh, right. at that time, a thriving metropolis at that time. So it was, uh, I, I don't want to, it wasn't easy by no means. Right. Uh, the development, it took as, as soon as I knew I had to, uh, I had the, the part, the role, I still had to work on being that guy that mean spirited guy if you will and again i'm not that guy i don't think i don't right. think a lot of us that <laughs> do martial arts are that mean spirited or, or normally or generally born mean spirited so right. it took a little bit to to go ahead and let it fly and and just be comfortable with doing it Hello, friends. Listen up for 60 seconds while I share my brand new show sponsor, Perry Athletics. I've been a trainer for over 10 years and worn every pair of athletic shorts from Lululemon and Roan to 10,000 and Nike. And I can confidently say that there is no training short that matches the quality, durability, and style of Perry Athletics. What makes Perry special, besides their slick style rooted in jujitsu, skateboarding, and Olympic weightlifting, is something called GSM, or grams per square meter, which refers to the weight of the fabric that you're training in. Unlike flimsy shorts that tear every time you touch a barbell, Perry is built to maximize performance by resisting damage and stretching to your thick thighs desire. Squat deep and feel the freedom. The shorts that I love are the five inch comp short, which are 160 GSM. They move well, look good, and transition between strength training and sparring seamlessly. Perry is also the only brand that I trusted to manufacture the show Rash Guards, which one listener hailed as, quote, the best rash guard they've ever worn. To snag your training shorts without breaking the bank, use the code MAIN, that's M-A-Y-N, at checkout for 15% off your entire order. I was going to say that the parallels to... I mean, a big draw for, you know, training martial arts is you get to experience to the furthest version of, of violence what yeah. that's like while, we're, like, if you and I are teammates, right, I want Tommy to be the best jiu-jitsu player he can be or, or the best martial artist. So I want you to be able to unleash that, and I want to be able to also, but at the same time, if you tap, I want it to be done, and so do you, so that you can restart and you can get better. But there is some kind of 
liberation to that. You know, it, martial arts gives you a, a version of yourself that you're not walking around the street, you know, picking fights with everyone and, and slapping hands and sitting down on the ground or trying to, trying to get any of that out. So it, it is a special environment. I wonder, you know, on this scale, this is a massive production, right? It's not like <laughs> you were cast in the local play at a high school or something. I mean, straight to the biggest screen that you can get on. Were there any changes that you felt yourself going through over this process from from the auditions through to the re- the filming of the movie to being, you know, in theaters alongside Martin Scorsese and Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio and being in that environment? Um changes ah uh, maybe a little more artistically and out of my comfort zone maybe uh, those type of changes really occurred and really happened for me uh, but through the whole process man I, I try to kept it Tommy Schultz 110 all the way through uh, and I, I you know you hear about some actors continuing their character you know offset I uh, I didn't I, I, I'm not I try not to do that. I try to keep work at work and home life, home life. And, and uh, that's my wife back there. But uh, uh, that's the way I kind of viewed viewed myself on and off the set. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to really mix them because t- right. Blackie Thompson's an asshole. Who wants to be an asshole <laughs> off, off work? Yeah, you're over at the Kraft Foods truck, just you know, ruining everybody's day. <laughs> yeah, who wants to do that? So, but I mean, but getting out of my comfort zone for sure uh, was was a big major change, and maybe being more comfortable with stepping off that ledge, jumping off that cliff, and and learning to soar. And if I did hit the ground, man, it don't hurt that long, you know. Right. Uh, and I think uh, that going through the whole process of Killers was. I think a major role in opening uh, uh, Matt Lindy and my gym together that played a major mm-hmm. part in it too. So uh, growth, yeah, there was a lot of growth in there, stepping out of my comfort zone, absolutely. But on the other hand, I try to keep it Tommy Schultz. On how does hand. one, how does one keep it Tommy Schultz? Let's say you're you're a, <clears throat> any individual, right, and you go over. It, it doesn't have to be with film necessarily, but any kind of change that's drastic, right? Like your your overnight exposure on something like this is different. People are asking you to be on podcasts. You're getting probably more acting opportunities. There's this potential new career path that exists. How do you keep yourself in line through all that? Because these are some major psychological changes for, for people. What is it that anchors you down into that... <clears throat> the being Tommy Schultz of being Tommy Schultz and not letting these kind of things get to you and chirp in your ear that um, you're bigger than you are or something like that. Like, how do you keep it so down to earth in that sense? Man, I wake up every morning, put my feet on the ground like you, man. That's it. If I can feel the cold, hard ground beneath my feet. That's it. That's, that's life right there. Uh, everything else is just a bonus. You get to enjoy it. You just have to learn how to enjoy it. I think I'm I'm pretty I'm in a really good spot right now, uh, considering that you know I'm not a uh, I'm not a Leo the Leo you know I'm not Leonardo DiCaprio I can still go outside and nobody's you know I can do that still I enjoy that still and that's why I want to keep it too. Um, it's I don't know man I just wake up and breathe like everybody else and if everybody thinks their air is different man let me know where you're at give us none because. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I don't know if you did. You watch the most recent fight, uh, Dustin Poirier and yes, Benice, I did. We just watched Benoit Saint Denis, yeah, right. So Joe Rogan gets in the d- unbelievable fight, right? Unbelievable display of just toughness, and I mean, hats off to Dustin Poirier. Oh, absolutely. And Joe Rogan gets in the in the ring, and he goes, first thing he says, he goes, "You're the man, Dustin Poirier," and immediately he goes, "I'm just a man, Joe Rogan," and it, it was like. I was like, wow, to have the awareness and the clarity in a moment like that, right? you just upset an undefeated yeah. monster who's coming for everybody's head. And you're the, the old guy that people are starting to count out who's been around for too long. And to have the awareness and the groundedness in that moment to just say, 
I'm breathing the same air as you. I'm just another guy with his feet on the ground kind of thing. It was really, it's humbling to see that every once in a while. You don't get to see that very often, especially in a sport like martial arts where the higher up they get, the more brashness and ostentatious these guys are. But I was just kind of like, man, I respect you when he said that, you know? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you, Abe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you opened your school, and that was while this movie was coming out or after the fact? It was uh, it was a little bit after the fact. Um, and uh, let me see. It, we got to work on it. It just came out in last October, the movie did, and we just got open yeah. – this year, January one, but nobody had any idea that I was opening a gym. I didn't tell I didn't tell the guys at the old my old gym. Uh, I didn't tell anybody. Uh, the only ones that knew it were my partner Matt Lindy, my wife, and his wife, pretty much, uh, and maybe maybe a few close friends. But you know, nothing. It's kind of like Bigfoot. Not until you see it happen, you don't believe <laughs> it. You know. So yeah. so it started happening, and it started becoming true, and. Uh, it just materialized into what it is right now. Uh, brand new school, starting slow. Got brand new members learning brand new technique. Uh, I I forgot the question. I'm sorry. Hey. No, no, that that was you're you're right on. It was just okay. about what it was like to open it, and it it was kind of a segue into another oh. thought that I had, which was about um just about dreams. Like oh. you would put this you had mentioned this bucket list thing, right? Like you, you threw move being in a, a major motion picture on this bucket list. And I would imagine maybe somewhere along there opening your own Academy is kind of a bucket list. Like it's a special it's, thing you get to give back with all your, your sweat equity that you earned in, in the mat time and everything and start to teach people. How important do you feel it is to put your dreams down on paper to, communicate them to people that you love to share them in in regards to their fruition in regards to actually seeing them happen putting it down in paper or just in general just in, ge in general like yeah. getting it out of your head and in this into some place or on some place where it's it's been communicated you know uh, i do i do my best communication uh, looking you in the eye and giving you a good handshake and a hug and telling you man i'm proud of you and i love you uh, I I don't do I don't do the social media a lot I don't I you know yep. and, and and you know, I know it's a good tool and it's a good way to tell everybody you love them you like them you're thinking of them but uh, uh, maybe it's just because my age and just the way I was raised but I just for me I love going to you personally and telling you if I get an opportunity a chance a, a phone call you know even phone calls are more personal than a text or a, a mention on Facebook or Instagram, you know, those are all great, right. but, you know, um, um, I guess just, just this personal contact one-on-one, -on -one, that's what I love. That's when I show my emotions better, I guess. Um, my wife can kind of vouch for this. I'm not, I'm not, I don't throw it out there a lot. I'm kind of a private guy. Uh, like I said, even when the movie was going on, I didn't tell anybody. I, I, I told everybody I had a part in it. Uh, even yeah. I myself didn't realize the, how large the role was. And so when it even came out, I was like, oh, wow. You know, and then I, I looked like a turd for not telling. I said, well, I didn't, I, I didn't know, you know. So and, 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 and that be, it might be a, just a character flaw in, in, on myself. And But I'd rather give love than receive uh you know your compliments and stuff. You know, I, I can give them a lot more than I can, and then I can receive it because you know you're like, oh, really? You enjoyed it? Okay. Yeah. You know, I doubt. I guess a little doubt in myself sometimes. You know, but where do you think where do you think that stems from? Because this is an interesting, I think, difference of character in a lot of people, especially today, right? Where we're growing, <clears throat> people are growing up in a social media age where it is uh, self promotion and shout yourself from the rooftop and celebrate your wins and and broadcast that right so where where do you think along the lines you developed that um kind of more isolated as like your your love is outward but it's not celebratory of yourself right yeah yeah that's a good 
description of it. Um, I don't know. I was a wildland firefighter for 17 years. I was just kind of thinking of that in my head. Where did it oh, come wow. from? Yeah, I think a lot of it came from my job. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, California, you know, you guys, y'all celebrate your wildfire land guys quite a bit you every show year them some love. yeah you show them some yeah. love you know and f- some wildland fire guys crews you know work their butts off all year round you know they don't get the uh recognition like some guys do and whatnot but again that's your job you don't go looking for the recognition and i think that's where where i don't i, I don't mind if i don't i don't get it i don't see it it's just where it comes from it's like you know, you, you go in to do a job, you go in to do what you're asked to go do and what you're signed up to go do. You don't you don't get to complain or gripe about it. You don't get to complain that you're sleeping on the ground. You signed up for the job. You right. know? <laughs> and I, I think that's where I, I, a lot of it, during those 17 years, I carry a lot of that wildland fire experience with me. Even, shoot, even to the day. I've been done with it since 2017, 2018. Right. So I've been out a while. But I still you were carry a, a wildland wildland fighter for 17 years. How did you get into that line of work? That's a <laughs> I had a my my cousin actually was looking to do this in Utah, and it was rigorous. I mean the yeah. to get accepted to pass the qualifications, and then also to accept the risk. You know, you're not you're not spraying water on a a little fire. You know, you're really putting yourself in the line of danger, and you have to have a very specific skill set to be able to succeed in that environment, and it's another one of those lines of work where you are dependent on the capabilities of your coworker, right? I mean, you guys are all protecting each other out there. So whoever is the lowest common denominator, everyone sinks to that level to, to proceed. So how did you get into wildlife firefighting? Man, that was back in right around 1999, 2000. There was a there was an article in the local newspaper here in Ada. I, I mean, a little bitty. I'm talking three sentences, two to three sentences. Do you want to be a wildland firefighter? Call four three six zero seven eight four. We're like, what? Yeah. That was it, man. We my my little brother actually got us. It was me, my little brother, and two of our good friends that we grew up with uh, from school. We. Uh, we were about 19, 20, not doing nothing at that age, you know. We didn't, Ada's still a small town. What, what 19,000? I guarantee it like it is now. So, uh, picked up the phone, made the phone call. They said, show up here at this time, this address, this date. Here's your training for the week long. Now, and, it, and it seems that it was a bad fire season. 2000 was a bad fire season for the United States at that time for the nation. And it was an emergency firefighter training. We all went through it. We all passed it. We all got our boots, uh, got our gear. And I think uh, two weeks later, my brother was gone. He went someplace. Uh, Montana, he went to Montana, and I had two engine details. I had gone to Alabama and Wyoming. to So it started off uh, my very first big career. What are the da- the daily risks like in a job like that? Are, are you constantly, I mean, I, I say deployed, meaning like, are you constantly in the line of fire, actually fighting them actively? Or you, what's like a week of that job? It's got to be insane. A week. Of, we had, when you went out of state on a deployment, you was 18 days or a little more, and some guys extended. But yeah. on the daily, it was, you know, just safety, working around other equipment and being around other personnel. I mean, you were either around dozers, engines, helicopters, seats. You could have been around anything on a, on a major fire. Uh most important, your own equipment. If you're part of your own equipment, hell, your 20-man hand crew could have been a problem if not everybody was had swivels. You know, uh, on their heads were swivels. That's what I meant. Uh, wildlife. You had the wildlife. Hell, you had the terrain. Your own two feet. It was like I said, head on a swivel. That's the way it was. You're looking everywhere, uh, and then. But sometimes you got a little downtime, hurry up and wait time, as they call it. And that's when most of yep. us would catch a nap if we could. 
uh, call wake up time was usually zero five. Briefing was zero six. I'm sure they got a lot of it still doing it that way today. And early mornings and late evenings, it seemed like a lot of them. But you just had to be aware every aware all the time. Situational awareness is what they call it. So, did you draw at all from that experience in your preparation to play someone like Blackie Thompson? I know I know they're not a hundred percent equivalent, but I feel like just hearing you, there's kind of aspects of this uh, kind of like rugged outlaw that in a way <laughs> the wildlife firefighter you're kind of in, you're rejecting by way of your action the the typical route that people go, right? You're not going in and getting an office job or something like that. It's this, you are kind of an outlaw. You are in the wild. You are doing things that are risky. And uh, like you said, your head on a swivel. I mean, I feel like someone like Blackie Thompson probably had his head on a swivel all the time. So did you draw on that at all when you're, when you're creating this person in your head? You know, I did. I did a little bit. Uh, you know, they would they would have us out in the middle of the best example I was give, the way they had the camp uh, for the set for the movie mm -hmm. reminded me exactly the way they would have uh, camp set up for wildland fire. They'd have, uh, you know, your eating facility or maybe a shower facility, uh, your food tent, and uh, your trailers for, you know, your incident command or, some, or your higher-ups, you know, who are producers, directors, whatever, you know, they had their own spot. So in regards, yeah, it actually, it, it, it reminded me very much, and it was very similar and very familiar to the way they had it set up. We was in the middle of nowhere for a lot of the set and for a lot of the movie shoots, so that was that was very reminiscent of how we would be in the middle of nowhere, head on a swivel, and I did pull from my fire experience uh some of some of the aspects of it yeah absolutely being and being comfortable around other people and being comfortable in front of people you know mm. not necessarily showing my love for people everywhere but being comfortable in front of strangers people i didn't know people i had to get used to and and during those 17 years of firefighting that's exactly what i had to do i it not not every time did I have the same hand crew, you know, the same 20 guys right. I went out with or the same engine crew. It could be someone totally different from a total s different state. You'd have to get to know right. them and get to know their work ethic well, real quick. So I, I, I did draw a lot from my fire experience, absolutely. Well, and I mean, if I'm choosing between walking into a fire or <laughs> walking on set a little nervous, right? One of those seems a little bit less life-threatening. So <laughs> maybe maybe they played into the nerves too. What what was it like? I and mean, this is just, I'm purely interested. I've never been on a movie set before. Uh, what was it like being on a set? You're, you're essentially there for, I mean, I think you said nine months was the shooting time, right? Yeah, they had nine months. I was fortunate enough to travel back and forth from Ada to Pahuska. Not, not a lot of the other folks did, of course, but I, I had the opportunity yeah. to be so close. But being on the set with him, going back and forth and working, um, it was interesting. I, that was my first time being on a big major set, too. I, I yeah. felt it, like I said, I, reminiscent of a fire, of a fire, um, <laughs> command yeah. so of a fire camp and I was, I was kind of familiar with everything and I kind of knew what to ask for you know who's the time lady around here who do I right. find to <laughs> sign my time you know they knew who I was talking about so um it was it was very comfortable as that goes uh, but uh, you know you always have to break the ice with new people strangers and stuff and mine's always hey how you doing Right. Saying hello to everybody, and then from there you can get usually get a good conversation. Isn't that crazy? When you look someone in the eyes, you shake their hand, you introduce yourself. That things tend to yeah. go pretty well, right? Yeah, it's the, the, ice, uh, the ice melts away, and then you yeah. can start talking. Unless so, when if if you drove in, so on, on a day that you drive into set, <clears throat> what's kind of a, what does a day look like? How much of that time is spent? Uh, with the camera rolling where you're actually like in character, the makeup's on, everything's ready to go. And then how much of that spent just kind of waiting around, doing absolutely nothing, waiting for oh, the man. next action? <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's almost like fire. There's a lot of hurry up and wait, but then when it's time to go, it's time to go. Man, I, I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, I can tell you that the waiting part was always longer than the shooting part. But then sometimes the waiting part was short 
and then you got to shoot and it was long so it still had it, it you know it's 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 it was always a vice versa it just depended on when you got there depending on when everybody was ready if everything was set up ready to go and then boom there you go and again sometimes you got ready you're in costume and you're waiting and that's just right. the way it goes it was it was fun i enjoyed it i, I it was relaxing it wasn't um just so nerve wracking that I couldn't I couldn't concentrate or focus. But and I, what was more amazing was the crew, the the crew that you know made sure you got on set on time. The crew that made sure the trailers were clean and everything for you, right. and just make sure you was eating, make sure everything. Everybody on that aspect, man, they were top notch. They did just they were professionals, professionals at their jobs. So like I said, they were great. See, I mean, that, that further drives the nail <clears throat> into the coffin that you're a, a down-to-earth person because you even picked that up, right? I mean, you could rep you could recognize that there are even people working behind the scenes. I feel like a lot of times you hear of people um, on sets or kind of their star stature makes them feel like they're lifted above that. But, hey, there's, I mean, there's gaffers, there's craft service food people, there's timestamp people, there's every person on a set uh, makes the movie, right? And then we get to go as viewers and see the final beautiful product, but there's so much behind the scenes that goes on. Was there anything that surprised you uh, from that regard that you were, you know, you didn't really expect to realize from actually being on a big movie set like this? Uh, I didn't realize how much the crew, the crew behind the scenes made the actors look phenomenal. Uh, without your sets looking the way they do, there's no way that we could, be in that moment i mean right like you're saying getting into that character how are you going to get into a character when it's 20 23 outside and when you see a right. set that's 1920s you're in character you get that makes it that much easier yeah my hats my hats off to the crew man uh i may i may be a talent but them guys some far more talented than i ever will get to be they made Pahuska looked like Pahuska back in 1920. They they did a phenomenal job wherever they went with the production. Uh, yeah, the the I, I don't I think you're right. I don't think uh, the crew behind the scenes. I don't think they get enough attention sometimes. I I know they have their award shows and stuff like that too, but I don't think they don't get enough bragging on them. Uh, especially yeah. especially a movie like Killers of the Flower Moon where there's limited green screen. I mean you. I don't know. I know I wasn't in front of a green screen. Green screen. I know that. So uh, that's that's what made the movie. That's what I enjoyed most about Killers of the Flower Moon. Hardly no green screen and just just a good storytelling. Like 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 Martin Scorsese does. Just good storytelling. I know you look at like Casino and The Departed and Taxi Driver and Killers and like especially in a, a day and age now where it's so easy to rely on special effects because everything's so good. Like the computer programs are so good, but to go and sit in a movie that's as long as killers and just be shown beautiful dialogue and fantastic shots when those are the two things, cause that's what film was originally, right? You get Absolutely. beautiful shots and good dialogue. And those two things create this beautiful story. And uh, to see that, today is is really special what were your when you went to the screening and you saw this thing for the first time oh. what were your initial thoughts there uh am i really in this movie <laughs> that's fine <my initial, laughs> yes really you are sir movie? Am I yes really you in are this movie? <laughs> are they gonna yeah. are they going to uh really put me in the movie as many scenes as i was in you know, uh, and then after, after the filming of it, after I was blown away, I, yeah. I could not believe the, the amount, <laughs> the amount of love they showed me on screen. I just could not believe yeah. how much screen time I had. It was truly amazing. Uh, but that was the first screening. The best screening though was with my kids. That was the best one. Yeah. Tell and me they, about that. They just... They looked over, just kept looking over at me, kept looking over at me. Yeah, it's you. I said, yeah, that's me. And to them, I'm just still dad, so that's what's still cool about it. They don't care. You're just, you're just dad, though, but you're up there, you know. <laughs> so that was that was the funnest screen. I think I think almost my family was there that day, mom, dad, and brothers. So. 
Yeah. Were you when you went into the initial screening? Were you under the impression that your the screen time would be less, or, or were you? <laughs> Had they it, had they told you like, hey, Tommy, you're really in this thing. Like you're really in this thing. I again, there you. Go. I, I I was told twice that yeah. you're you got a major role in this, and I'm like, okay, and I okay, you know, right. thank you. I mean, I don't know what to say. Okay, I was told that twice. I was told that once by Miss Ellen Lewis, and she says, you don't realize how big your role is, and I said, no, I don't. And then again, nobody told me how much screen time I had no one said anything about uh seconds minutes or anything I, I first first screen I saw it I imagine that's when the world got to see it too and I was like uh, I, I was blown away man I I was blown away I I dude I'm still I'm still beyond words about it so um I was blown away I I didn't even know you then and I saw it and I was like I could just I could tell from I could tell from your ears that what you did, what you had spent a lot of time doing was grappling because they don't get there unless you put in the mat time period. So I knew, uh, either two things happened. One, they decided to do prosthetic cauliflower ear, which would make no sense for the movie. <laughs> right. So I knew that was real. <laughs> so then I was thinking about the mat time and I'm like, wow, this guy's really dedicated a lot of time to grappling. So he must be in other stuff. And then when I looked, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is the first role. This is incredible. You know, seeing it was just so cool. And again, it was dialogue forward. So it's you and Leo on the screen having a conversation. It is not you flying across on a boom broomstick or something crazy like that. It's, it was such a good drawn in scene. Was there, when you're filming those scenes with him, how do you, how do you manage nerves? I mean, I, I imagine just like before you get onto the first the mats for a competition for the first time, doesn't matter if you're an athlete, doesn't matter if you play football, it doesn't matter anything, you're going to be nervous. And nerves are good because they heighten your performance in whatever you do. So how do you manage nerves in a situation like that? I'm, I'm sure that they were evident, yeah? Uh, I hope so. I hope they were evident. I felt they were evident. Uh, I, I just, I don't know, man. I just kept, I just try to not fan out so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I think oh, I that imagine. was. I think when I when I closed up and didn't talk to him much, I just looked at him and, and just said, shook my head and agreed with what he said. I think that was it right there. But yeah. uh, we 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 would conversate a couple. We, we conversated on on you know behind the scenes a couple of times, and he was he was pretty funny and very made me feel comfortable. And I think after we you know conversed a little bit, my my nerves they they were like cut in half. Uh, and when we did the scenes, it was, I was like, all right, cool. This, this will work. You know, he, he's going to yeah. make me work for it. So let's go. Um, I think the first time he started improv on me though, it took me by surprise. I think it was in the interrogation room. He took me yeah. a little bit by surprise because when he started, I was like, oh no, I, there's none of the script. Whatever he's saying <laughs> is not part of the script. And so there, and I had to go, I had to just do my best to stay up with him. Yeah. Wow. What an inc what an incredible experience. I mean, uh I want to, you know, once in a lifetime and hopefully more in a lifetime for you uh yeah. experience to see when when you got done with this and you had gone through the process, you'd done all the auditions, that weird covid hiatus where you weren't even, you know, in communication to then getting called back to doing the recasting and shooting all this and then it's over. What are your your hopes or, or dreams regarding acne? Is this something that now you're kind of like, wow, you know, I really like this. That was cool for me. I could, I think, I could get behind this and really pursue this, or does that just function as like a bucket list item? You throw a check mark on it, and then it's back to back to the school. No, man, I want to keep doing it. Um, I actually just got through doing another little feature film with uh, Lou Diamond Phillips called Keep Quiet. We just finished up uh, this oh, past wow. month. Yeah. So yeah, I I went ahead and got me an agent, uh, yep. uh, Miss Linda McAllister, and I I want to keep doing this. I'm looking trying to get some more acting classes and stuff. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of polishing up what I need to polish up on. But yeah, I'm looking forward to this as well as as well as the school, man. Um, I don't I don't have a I don't have a quitting bone in me, and you know, when you find something you enjoy. 
And, you know, here goes that bucket list. When you find something to enjoy, if you've wrote, written it down, if you put it down somewhere, go after it. I mean, there, you only got so much time on this beautiful planet. Go after all the things that you want to go get. You know, if it makes you happy, go get it because, man, we all got the same amount of time during the day. Yeah, I, yeah. I look forward to it. Act, I, when I lived in Los Angeles, I, I took acting classes for a stint of time, more out of curiosity. And <clears throat> I was blown away at how developmental that was, actually. Kind of similar to the way that martial arts teaches you so much about yourself that you can't learn in a normal setting. Like, you can develop your character and, and so many parts of your who you are. But when you're on a map for the first time, you get your ass kicked and you realize there's nothing you can do about it, it kind of changes you. And you're either more interested or you run. And so That's for those right. of us that have s stuck around for a really long time, you realize that there's a lot of layers on this onion and things like martial arts peel them a little bit. And when I did this acting class, I was really surprised at how much I <clears throat> was exposed to just emotion in general, how we hide it, how we mask it, how we avoid it, uh, how we show it, all that kind of stuff. And I think it's it always makes me really excited by acting performance when I see it because when you see something that feels real you know that they the acting was so good that it made it seem that way right like yeah. you're watching you on screen as Blackie Thompson just comes off as you're on screen as Blackie Thompson it doesn't come off as this guy's trying to be Blackie Thompson that's that's how you know that you're seeing good acting is because you're just responding to the moment you know over and over and I I mean this is corny, but to reach all the way back into jujitsu, just like a match, right? A live role. What are you doing? After you've been doing it for five years, six years, you're just responding to the moment, right? That's right. I take That's your lapel, right. you break the grip. I get on your hook, you throw a wizard. It's like there's something really special about that. Did you <laughs> did you ever piece those together like your your acting prowess and your love for martial arts <laughs> yes i did i i use it I, I use it in class as a metaphor all the time you know i mean uh just being able to just yeah put the pieces together man just this how it rose if, if you know how to get out of a side mount you know if you get to your half guard you know oh yeah absolutely uh, and then just I felt more like a it felt more like a flow row, you know, doing the acting. Yeah. If that that feel, the acting feels more like the flow row on, yeah. on you know right before you get to your tournament, and then you just boom, you know, that's what that <laughs> felt like the, the 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 flow row of all of it all. And then you you don't know, I guess when you after take after take after take, you know, that's kind of like your rounds, you know, you're like ah ah, yeah. can I get better? Do I need to get better? What do I need to change? And, of course, your coach will tell you if you need to change something as you're going. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, absolutely, man. It, it's, you know, it's just crazy how the martial, our martial arts plays a part, uh, uh, contributes a little bit to everything in your life, no matter what yeah. you do. So I, I think it just – I don't think if I had the martial arts, I don't think I really would have uh, trudged forward with it and had the courage to continue with it. So it did. It, it it plays a good basic part in my life and how I think about things now and how I react to a lot of things. So prior prior to finding martial arts, and I, I don't know if your your entrance was jujitsu or if it was striking, but did you did you have an issue with being reactive or, uh, yeah, I guess reactive is the right word. Being reactive prior to to finding martial arts. Uh, it was jujitsu I started with, no wrestling background or anything, straight jujitsu. Same. Oh, awesome. I th I think you know the reaction came a lot with being a wildland firefighter again. I I uh, some of my some of my stuff I instruct I I have I revert and bring my fire training into my school mm -hmm. a little bit. Some of my sayings and some of the way we think and talk, uh, kind of like keep your head on a swivel. You know, you, you still look, seeing what you're doing, where you're putting your hand, what you got to do. And then sometimes you know what to do instinctively, you know. Uh, you know, if I pull the chainsaw off the truck, first thing I'm doing is make sure the blade's sharp, oil's in the oil spot, gas is in the gas spot, it fires up, we're ready to rock. No different, you know, we're warming up for our match. Uh, no different from an audition or, or take one 
take two, take three, you know, it's warming up until they until you hit it right. So, yeah, uh, a lot of everything goes into it. I mean, I think if you just focus and tunnel, have that tunnel vision on one thing and, and not pick some little experiences in your life to help out with what you're trying to express to other people yeah. uh, or communicate, cause we'll get lost a lot of times. Yeah, it's uh, it's really impressive seeing in so many different people's lives that I talk to that are directly involved in martial arts, like an ADCC competitor or partially involved in martial arts, or maybe martial arts is something they did a, a long time ago and it set them up. But you can see this thread that everyone's able to pull on where it's taught them something that they can't unlearn. And that something benefits them in all these different aspects of their life. And it's a it's a beautiful form of therapy in some degree, right? To be able to go and kind of ring yourself out on the mat with your teammates. And I know it makes me a better person when I walk through the world. Yes, absolutely. I, it's just you know, stress, big yeah. stress reliever. And, you know, I guess, I guess, you know, I think of our school too, like a men's club too, you know, there's a lot of things we could all go hang out and do bars a lot of bars you can go to hang out and drink at i just don't think you build the the the, the, the quite the same camaraderie as blood sweat and tears on the mat and again blood sweat and tears that goes for firefighting too it even goes for acting you know uh once you share share that with somebody you know you get to understand that person a little bit more uh and they get to understand you a little bit more and then you know again that ice is melted and you build relationships yeah. Well, Tommy, it's uh it's been incredible being able to talk to you. You're a you're a very down to earth real person as I've said, but it comes through even more when you actually get to to speak face to face. And I think it's it's incredible to hear your perspectives on how you view this all despite the scale. I mean, I I really can't it's I would imagine trying to explain this to someone who doesn't understand film like <laughs> there's not really a way to explain how big of a deal this is yet you you see it so so well with so much awareness and i feel like you're 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 destined to just continue doing great things because you have such a beautiful mindset about it we i think we need more tommy schultz's Aww. being tommy schultz you know <laughs> thank you so much man thank you so much Abe. Yeah. i appreciate that man i i mean <sighs> I guess I'm not going to disagree with you, brother. I'm yeah. not going to disagree with you. So I appreciate that, man. Handshakes yeah. and hugs, baby. Handshakes and hugs. I'm all about them. That's right. Well, we will uh, We will definitely have to do this again. I will be watching your career very closely and uh, and your school. And if you're ever in the same place, we'd obviously have to get a good training session. But I, I really respect you, and I, I thank you so much for taking the time to be here and sharing your story. It's a unique one that I know oh. is inspiring for a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you very much, Abe. And yeah, same. If you ever in Oklahoma, eight away, stop by, man. You got a you got a mat to fall on, brother. There we go. Hey, friends, Abe here. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode and sticking around to the very end. If you want to support it, leave a five star review on Spotify or check out www.mainideapodcast.com. Join the mailing list and stay up to date on all things the main idea from future guests, sponsorship opportunities, products that I'm using to help me perform at my best, invites to ask me anything, and any upcoming pertinent information to the show. I cannot do this show without you. It is literally why I show up each week and put these episodes together. So thank you from the bottom of my heart from being part of the community. I hope you have a great day.